Okay, so linear structure in function spaces. Um, so we'll finish up uh, our voyage through linear algebra by looking at uh, linear independence of functions, span of functions, can you have a basis of functions, right? The three things that we ended up looking at. And then what's a linear transformation? The derivative is linear transformation. And why did we multiply by t when we're doing undetermined coefficients? So if f is the set of all functions that have a common domain, we know that this is vector space. We saw that earlier. And so you can define linear dependence of functions the same way you define linear independence of vectors. So a set of functions, f1, f2, of fn, is linearly independent if the only solution to the occasion k1, f1, plus k2, f2, plus dot, 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 k and fn equals zero is k1, k2, all of them are equal zero, no matter what t is. And that actually is pretty important. So suppose we want to show that these are linearly independent. So we want to show only solution to k1 t squared plus k2 sine t equals zero comma for all t is k1 equals zero k2 equals zero so how can we show that well suppose it wasn't true suppose there was k1, k2, not zero with k1 t squared plus k2 sine of t equal to zero. So what does that mean? That means that k1 t squared equals minus k2 sine of t, which means that k1 over k2 is equal to sine of t minus sine over t squared. But this is a constant. k1 and k2 are constants. This changes depending on t. Right? And we need that the solution doesn't depend on t, right? Two numbers, k1 and k2, you multiply by t squared and sine t, and you get zero regardless of what t you pick. But that would mean that this function is a constant, and we know it's not a constant. So this condition is impossible. So most functions are actually linearly independent, right? Because, you know, if you want to add two functions together, multiplying by constants to add together to get zero, they pretty much have to be the same function, right? So to show that these three functions, remember that this is the constant function y equals one, it's a horizontal line, are linearly independent. So you need to show the only solution to k1 t squared plus k2 t plus k3 times one equals zero. For all t, no matter what t is, is k1 equals zero, k2 equals zero, k3 equals zero. But of course, right, there's no way that this can be equal to zero for all t because this left-hand side is a parabola, right? If k1 isn't equal to zero. But if they're not all zero, what you have on the left-hand side is some kind of a function that's not zero, right? You get a nice parabola. This is not the zero function. Right, so the only way you can actually have this equation equal to zero means that k1, k2, and k3 equals zero. And so it's really just stating things that you already know about functions. You do have to be a little bit careful though sometimes because functions can be a little bit tricky, especially triggered entities. So are these linearly independent? Well, they're not because we said show that they're not. So can we find K1 sine T plus K2 cosine T plus five pi over two equal to zero with K1 and K2 not zero? Is that possible? Well, 
let's pull out the triggered entities. Cosine t plus five pi over two is equal to cosine t cosine five pi over t two minus sine t sine five pi over two. We need to remember what cosine of five pi over two and sine five pi over two is. So if we remember our unit circle, one pi over two is here. 2 pi over 2 is pi, 3 pi over 2 is down here, 4 pi over 2. This is 5 pi over 2 here. So cosine of 5 pi over 2 is 0. Sine of 5 pi over 2 equals 1. So cosine t plus 5 pi over 2 equals minus sine t because this all goes away because that's equal to zero and this just equals minus sine t. So what can we take K1 and K2 to be? Well, we'll just take K1 equal to one, K2 equal to one, and what do you get? You get sine of t, because that's K1 is one times sine of t plus one times minus sine of t. That equals zero. So these two are not linearly independent, right? Because g2 of t is actually just minus sine t. It's a constant times sine of t. So you have to be a little bit careful sometimes to deal with that. So where did we see these kinds of functions, these sorts of problems, right? This kind of stuff shows up when we're doing undetermined coefficients. So let's look at this and think about um, linear independence of functions. And when we're doing undetermined coefficients, we actually relied on uh, linear independence of functions, but we didn't actually call it that. So what's the solution of this? Well, we know y sub h, you solve dy dt equals to 3y. So k, oops, y sub h equals k e to the 3t. Good enough. What's our guess? Well, our guess would be y p of t is, I've got a, um, this whole thing here is what we call q of t. And it involves a line, so we'll call it a t plus b. And then a sine function, so I'm going to need a c times cosine of t plus a d times sine of t. And then I have to solve for a, b, and c. So how do we go about doing that? We take y prime of t, we take the derivative, that's a minus c cosine of t plus, oops, sine of t plus d cosine of t. And you plug everything in. So y prime is a minus c sine of t plus d cosine of t. I plug that in for the left side. The right side is going to be 3 times yp, which is 3 times this whole thing. So that'd be 3at plus 3b plus 3c cosine t plus 3d sine t plus q of t, which is this stuff, plus 2t plus 1 plus sine of t. So I'm going to gather everything together on the right-hand side. Zero equals what? Well, we'll start by looking at t. And we've got no t terms over there, but we've got a 3a t here. So that's this, nope, not that term. Let me undo that real quick. That's this term. And then we have constants, right? And constants are things times the function one. So we have a constant here on the left side. I need to bring that over to the right side. So it comes across as a minus a. I have a constant here. Oh, shoot. Going to have to back up here a little bit. Sorry about this. Got a little bit carried away. i do that one more time. So I've got 3at here. And I forgot about the q of t. Plus 2. Great. 
now we'll move to the constant terms. So I have a one times this, but this has to come over to the right side. So it's a minus a. Then I have a three B as a constant and I have a plus one. So that takes care of those terms. And then what do I have times cosine t? Well, I've got a d on the left-hand side that'll come across as a minus d. I've got a 3c on the right-hand side. And then finally, I need, um, kind of running out of room here, so I'll just put it down here, sine of t. I've got a minus c sine t that'll come over as a plus c. That's this term. And then I have a 3d sine t and a plus one. So what do I have? I have four vectors, four functions, f1 of t equals t, that's here, f2 of t equals one, constant function, f3 of t equals cosine t, that's this term, and f4 of t equals sine t, that's this term. So we think of these things as being four vectors. They're literally independent. So if I have a bunch of vectors times constants added together to get zero, and the vectors are all linearly independent, what does that mean? It means all the coefficients have to be zero. And that's where we relied on linear independence, right? Because those functions are linearly independent, the only way that we can add them all together and get zero is if all the coefficients are zero. And then you have to solve for the coefficients. Um, and we're kind of running out of room here, so I'm not going to go through it in detail. But note that you can, right? We've got one, two, three, four equations, and we've got one, two, three, four variables. So the first equation will be 3a and then 0, 0, 0. We set up our augmented matrix is minus 2. This will be my a column, my b column, my c column, and my d column. Second equation has got a minus 1a and a 3b equal to minus 1 if you move this plus 1 over. And no c or d terms. Third equation has got a 3c and a minus 1d equal to 0, and no a and b terms. And the last equation has got 1c and 3ds and a minus 1 and 0, 0. So that's our augmented matrix. You have to solve that for a, b, c, d. Um, note that the augmented matrix will have four leading ones because you'll get a leading one here. There's only one thing in here, so there's a leading one here. And then these two rows are not multiples of each other, so you'll end up with a leading one here and here. And you'll actually end up with, if I did my calculations correct, I'm not going to go through it in detail. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Um, minus 2 thirds. So A equals minus 2 thirds, B equals minus 5 ninths. D equals minus one over 10, and D equals minus three over 10. Great. And so that's um, where linear independence sneaked into what we're doing with undetermined coefficients. So what about span in function spaces? What's the span of this? Well, the span of a single vector, if we think of a function as a vector, the span is k times e to the minus three t, right? k times a vector. Span of these, these are all linearly independent, right? None of them can be actually written as multiple of each other. And you can check that using the techniques we used earlier. So the span of this would be k1 e to the minus 3t plus k2 e to the 7t plus k3 e to the t. And hopefully you're recognizing that the span of these functions are, in fact, are solutions to. Uh, differential equations when we're doing um, homogeneous solutions. So there's our span of e to the minus 3t. 
k e to the minus 3t. Here's a set of functions. So what's the homogeneous differential equation that has this as its solution? Well, we know that r should be minus 3, r equals 7, and r equals 1 are the three eigenvalues. And we'll see why they're called eigenvalues when we do linear systems. Um, and so that means we have r plus 3, r minus 7, r minus 1 as factors. You multiply those three together, which I'm not going to do in detail, you get um, r cubed minus 5, r squared, 17 r plus 21 equals 0. So d cubed y dt squared dt cubed minus 5 d squared y dt squared minus 17 dy dt plus 21y equals 0. So this homogeneous differential equation has that as its solution. And we can think of this as being a span. We have three vectors times um, the solutions. It's a three-dimensional subspace of function space. So can you find a basis for all function space? Not really. It's infinite dimensional. So if you remember Taylor series, right? Taylor series is expanding things in terms of these functions, right? If you take these functions, which are all linearly independent, there's infinitely many of them, you can get functions as, if you remember your power series stuff, uh, n equals zero to infinity, a sub n x to the n, right? And so you can think of this as being the span this is saying that some function is in the span of these vectors. But then you have to get into the ratio test, the root test, and all that kind of stuff. We really don't want to go there. So finding a basis for all the function space is actually really hard. Um, you can find bases for interesting subspaces, right? And that's what we've done up here. Um, but a basis for all the function spaces is hard to come up with. So the derivative is linear transformation. So I want to talk about this a little bit. We're not going to do a whole lot with this, but we want to um, just think about this, the structure of differentiation. So functions between function spaces. So functions that take functions to other functions, right? These are often called operators or transforms. So multiplication by a matrix has several nice properties. Linearity is the most important thing. So M, a is a number, V is a vector, and you can distribute the M through there, and you get A times MV plus B times MW. And we use this property, right? This is linearity to define what a linear transformation is. And so between any two vector space, don't want the vectors there, um, between two vector spaces, V1 and V2 is a function from V1, which is your domain, to V2, which is your codomain that satisfies linearity, right? a times a vector plus b times a vector, when you put them through the function t, you can calculate that just by calculating t on the vector and t on the other vector, multiplying by your various coefficients and then adding them together. Right? And that was really important, right? Linear transformations for dealing with matrices because that meant we could only, we could focus our attention just on the basis vectors, see where they go, and then that drags the entire domain along with it. So is D a linear transformation? So D, oops, where did my pen go? I have to define what I mean by D. And D is just defining that, differentiating a function. OK, so is D a linear transformation? Well, if I take a function, plus a constant times another function, and I want to differentiate it, right? That means d by dt of a f of t plus b g of t. And if you differentiate, sure enough, 
to get linearity because what can you do? You can differentiate each function and then multiply it by the corresponding coefficient and then add them together. So D is a linear transformation. If we had a nice basis for function space, we could create D as a differentiation as an infinite dimensional matrix, but we don't, so we can't. Null space of D, right? The null space of any operator is solutions to this, right? It's homogeneous solutions or solutions to dy dt equals zero. So the null space is y equals c. But we want to write that as a constant times a vector, right? So take y of t equals one, that's a function. The null space of the derivative function is the span of the constant function y of t equals one. And the span of that is everything of the form c times one or a constant, right? So the null space of d, that's the plus c in calculus, because if we want to solve dy equals some vector, right? Or a matrix times y equals some vector, what do you get? You get y equals to some specific function, usually called g of t, plus something in the null space. So that's c. So the C shows up because it's the null space of that. And capital G of T is a function whose derivative, it's the antiderivative of little g of T. So the plus C here in calculus is really um, the null space of the differential operator. Eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of D, that means we're looking for dy equals lambda y, or we need to solve this differential equation. We know what the solutions to that is. That's k e to the lambda t. So this is the eigenfunction. Um, yep, and the lambda is the eigenvalue. The k here is just saying that the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of d any multiple of k is an eigen, any multiple of e to the lambda t is an eigenfunction itself, right? Eigenfunctions are actually a span. So, um, so that's the eigenvalues and eigenfunction. So D behaves like multiplication by a matrix. Differentiation behaves like multiplication by a matrix. And so you can create other operators from the derivative operator. So D plus two, Operating on a function y, you define that to be the derivative of y plus two times y. And that's the left hand side of a um, of many of the function of the derivatives that of the ordinary different equations that we've seen. And this is linear. Well, d plus two times a f plus b g would be that plus two uh, plus two times the quantity a f plus b g right distribute the d distribute the two and then that becomes well we know that d is oops a times two times f plus B times two times F. So derivative of F, but this now is A times D plus two applied from to F plus B times D plus two applied to F. So this operator is a linear operator. It's got null space, it's got an image, it's got all that kind of nice stuff. What's the null space of that? D plus two, y equals zero, right? All solutions to that. But we recognize this as being a homogeneous first order linear differential equation. And we know what the solution to that is, is k e to the minus 2t. 
So when we look at this, we think this is a vector, e to the minus 2t. This is something that's saying the solutions to this equation are any thing in the span of this. And then when you had an initial condition, the initial condition allows you to pick out exactly which function in the span we want. So the method of undetermined coefficients kind of leverages this algebraic structure about uh, differential equations, and that's how it works. So why do we multiply by t? We did that a couple of times in dealing with undetermined coefficients. And the derivative function is a linear transformation, but it has a very nice property, which we call the product rule. And one particular example of which is this, right? So if I take a function and I multiply by t and I take the derivative, I get the function plus t times the derivative of the function, right? Derivative of the first times the second plus first times the derivative of the second. So suppose we want to solve that equation, right? And that's the equation dy dt plus 2y equals e to the minus 2t. We know that the homogeneous solution is k e to the minus 2t. Um, but the homogeneous solution means this is in the null space of the differential operator d plus two. In other words, d plus two times e to the minus two t equals zero. Right? That's what it means to be in the null space. So if we make this as our guess, if we guess that and we plug it into the left-hand side, all you get is zero. You're not gonna get this function of it, out of that. So we guess yp equals t e to the minus two t. The left-hand side is d plus two. Well, we throw in a function, a uh, number in here somewhere, alpha. Alpha t e to the minus two t. And when we differentiate that, the d turns into alpha times e to the minus two t plus t, that's this part, times the derivative of e to the minus two t with the alpha coming along for the right. Right, so that's the D and the F of T is the E to the minus two T. And then plus alpha times T times two E to the minus two T. But this whole side now is alpha times T times D plus two E to the minus two T. And we know e to the minus 2t is in the null space of d plus 2, so this whole thing equals 0. But we're left with that. And so that means we can set that equal to the right-hand side and figure out what alpha is. So why do we multiply by t? Because we can get this nice example and then things, nice product rule, and then we actually get a nice term that stays behind. So when we're dealing with second order differential equations, right? We can actually different, we can actually factor them a little bit. And this is where our characteristic equation came from. So the left-hand side is just the second derivative of y plus five times the first derivative of y plus six times y. What's the right-hand side? That's gonna be, right, the d is, derivative with respect to t plus three of derivative with respect to t plus two of y. Okay, so that's gonna be d e by dt plus three, that operator. This operator applied to y just gives you dy dt plus 2y. So this operator applied to this means take the derivative of everything in here. So it's sort of distributing, almost foiling it out. d by dt of dy dt is d squared y dt squared. Outer derivative of 2y is 2 times the derivative of y. Inner 3 times dy dt is 3 dy dt and outer three times two y is plus six y. 
and you add them together. You get five dy dt plus six y. So you can factor these things, right? And that's how we got our um, characteristic equations. So the solution to this thing is the span of the solutions to that. So if something is a solution to this, right? D squared plus five D, oops, five D plus six Y, that's D plus three, apply to d plus two, apply to y, right? If y satisfies if y is in the null space of d plus two, then d plus two y equals zero. We get a zero in here, the derivative of zero is zero, plus three equals zero. So if we're solving this equal to zero, if this goes to zero, then this operator is still just gonna give you zero on it. Note that there's no particular reason that we can write d plus two first and d plus three second. We could have written it like this. And then you solve this equal to zero and get a solution. And if you find a y so that d plus three y equals zero, then um, d plus two of that is just gonna be zero as well. So what are the solutions to these? What's the solution to this equation? Y equals k1 e to the minus t, oh, e to the minus two t plus k2 e to the minus three t. We solve this equal to zero and that equal to zero. And so that's why we could use a characteristic equation. But the problem, of course, is what happens if you have, oh, this is, I did a bad job of typing here. That should be a four and a four. So d squared plus 4d plus four, that's where we got that repeated root. So, d squared plus 4d plus 4 operating on y is the same thing as d plus 2 operating on d plus 2 of y. So solutions, oh, and we want this all equal to 0. Solutions, well, one solution is to solve d plus 2 y equal to 0. And that just gives you y equals k1 e to the minus 2t, because this is dy dt plus 2y equals 0. The other solution is if d plus 2y, if we can find some function y so that d plus 2 applied to y is in null space of d plus 2. But we know what the null space of d plus two is. So if d plus two y is in the null space of d plus two, that means if we take this thing and we have it here, then we apply d plus two it again, then we, this thing will be canceled out by the d plus two and we'll get zero. But this thing, To be in the null space, we know what the null space is. It's things like that. So to be in the null space, you'd have to solve that. Or d by dt, dy dt plus 2y equals e to the minus 2t. So we want a function where this thing is in the null space of d plus 2. And so what function satisfies this equation? Well, that's y equals t e to the minus 2t. And that's what we showed in the earlier example. So the solution to this then is y equals k1 e to the minus 2t plus k2 t e to the minus 2t, the span of these two vectors. So this last part about um, derivative operators, we're not going to go into that uh, much at all. 
Um, but I thought you should see it because it's what's underlying the um, why undetermined coefficients worked. So that's sort of the theoretical reasoning for that. <clears throat> 